To clarify the aim of the expedition, let me quote from the official instructions. When you reach the northern coast of Spitsbergen, they wrote, you should choose a harbor or cove to anchor the Hecla. Then secure the ship and proceed northward with the boats, which have been provided specifically for this mission under your supervision. Do your utmost to reach the North Pole. Make the necessary observations as specified in your previous voyages to the northern regions and those recommended by the Royal Society's Council, in addition to your own experience. You must return to Spitsbergen before winter sets in, and at a time in autumn that guarantees the vessels under your command will not freeze up and be forced to winter there. The sled boats mentioned were quite unique and appropriate for their intended use. They were flat-bottomed, twenty feet long and seven feet wide at their widest point. A frame made of ash and hickory supported a waterproof sheet coated with tar. On the outside, there was a layer of thin fur planking, then a sheet of strong felt, and finally, a thin oak planking. Steel-shod runners were attached to either side of the keel, and a span of hide rope was fixed to the front of the runner for dragging the boat over the ice. The equipment also included a 19-foot bamboo mast, a tanned duck sail that could double as an awning, a spreader, a boat hook, 14 paddles, and a steering oar ring. The expedition set sail on April 4th, 1827, and on the 17th the Hecla found itself off Hammerfest, a port on the island of Soroy, off the Lapland coast. The plan was to collect several tame reindeer, which could potentially be useful for pulling the boats along the ice, but as it turned out, they were not needed. By mid-May they had reached Spitsbergen, and after a month of searching for a suitable harbor for the Hecla, they finally found one on the north coast of West Spitsbergen called Treurenberg Bay. They secured the Hecla and prepared to journey toward the North Pole. On the afternoon of June 21st, the boats, loaded with provisions for seventy-one days, began their voyage. They left the reindeer behind since the ice was so rough that they would be useless. The weather was fine, the boats were seaworthy, and they soon passed Little Table Island, the last piece of land they would see for some time. Once they reached the ice, their difficulties began. They expected the journey to be arduous, and they were not disappointed. They had to traverse small, rugged flows of ice, separated by pools of water that they had to cross multiple times. They had to unload the boats each time, drag them through chasms and over great hummocks of ice, and then return to their starting point for clothes and food. Thus, their progress was slow and tedious, and on the first day they only made two and a half miles. Perry had opted for nocturnal travel for various reasons. Although there was no darkness during an Arctic summer, the sun was less intense at night, resulting in firmer snow and less eye-straining glare. Moreover, sleeping during warmer hours allowed them to dry their working clothes, which were often waterlogged. After navigating the preliminary field of broken ice, they had hoped to find a level sheet of ice, but the conditions worsened with time. Heavy rain soaked the explorers on the morning of the 26th, covering nearly half of the ice with shallow pools. The rain persisted almost constantly, and Perry noted that the climate of these remote polar regions was milder than that of the northern shores of America, seven to fifteen degrees further south. The rain was often accompanied by fog, and they found that much of the surface ice was made of vertical needle-like crystals that provided poor footing and cut their boots and feet. Each day was much like the next on their arduous journey. The party rose around eight in the evening upon hearing a bugle reveille. After prayers, they changed out of their fur sleeping suits into their wet or frozen walking clothes, had cocoa and biscuits for breakfast, loaded the sleds, and began the day's work. Their course varied but remained challenging. At times, they had to exert themselves to move the boat over nearly vertical blocks of ice. Other times they struggled through slushy snow, sinking so deeply that it once took them two hours to cover a mere hundred yards. The channels between ice blocks were sometimes as narrow as half the boat's length, requiring them to ferry provisions on blocks of ice. This was a nerve-wracking task, as any mishap could leave the whole party to starve. After laboring for five to ten hours, covering only four or five miles, they would stop for the day, changing into dry clothes, repairing their gear, eating supper, 
and retiring for the day. As they headed northward, their progress slowed. Perry had given up on reaching the North Pole, but hoped to touch the 83rd parallel and claim the 1,000 pounds reward offered by the government. However, he was unprepared for the bitter disappointment he would face in late July. On the 20th, he determined that his latitude was only 82 degrees 36 minutes, less than five miles north of his position on the 17th, though he was sure they had covered at least 12 miles. His observations yielded the same result for the next few days, consistently placing him several miles south of where he thought he was. He concluded that the ice was drifting southward, erasing much of their hard-won gains during the day. After reaching latitude 82 degrees, a point never before attained, he decided to turn back. He was only 172 miles from the Hecla, with 100 miles over water and the remaining 72 miles over ice. They had traveled about 580 miles, almost exactly the distance from the Hecla to the Pole in a direct line. On July 27th, the return journey began, and on August 21st, they reached the Hecla without any issues. They set sail for home on August 28th, and on September 29th, Perry reported to the Admiralty, where he met Franklin, who had returned from his North American journey on the same day. Perry received enthusiastic reception and honors in England and on the continent, but he never sailed the polar seas again. Chapter 9. The Adventures of Ross The notion of discovering a northwest passage, while momentarily overshadowed by Perry's grand endeavor to reach the North Pole, was not abandoned. In 1828, soon after the polar expedition's return, Captain John Ross presented the government with a plan for the long-awaited route through Prince Regent's Inlet. It's worth noting that Ross had prior experience with Arctic navigation, having embarked on a voyage through Baffin's Bay in 1818 with the Isabella and Alexander, with Perry as his second in command. He made a name for himself on that occasion by surmising that Lancaster Sound was a landlocked bay. Perhaps because of this blunder, the government declined to consider his latest proposal. Nonetheless, thanks to his friend Mr. Felix Booth's generosity, Ross purchased and equipped a paddle steamer called the Victory in 1829. The Victory had previously been a steamship running between Liverpool and the Isle of Man. Of course, steam-powered navigation was in its nascent stages then, and sailing the Arctic seas in a vessel propelled by the newfangled power source had yet to be attempted. The drawbacks of paddles in icy waters were numerous and obvious, but an ingenious device allowed the paddles to be lifted out of the water in a matter of seconds. Additionally, the Victory was outfitted to function as a sailing vessel if necessary. As soon as word got out about the expedition, Ross was inundated with offers of assistance from many experienced Arctic navigators, including Lieutenant Hopner, Perry's former colleague, and Captain Back, Franklin's friend and companion. However, he couldn't accept their overtures since he had already designated his nephew, Lieutenant James Clark Ross, as his second-in-command. The Victory sailed on May 23, 1829, and it was fortunate that she had her sails to rely on, for the machinery was crude and constantly malfunctioning, ultimately being thrown away. Lancaster Sound was reached without incident, and on August 10, the Victory entered Prince Regent's Inlet. Ross headed for the western shore and landed near the spot where the Fury was lost on Perry's previous expedition. The shore was covered in coal, and the officer's mess hut was stocked with supplies that were invaluable to the explorers. Despite four years of exposure to the elements, the preserved meats and vegetables were still in excellent condition. The victory had been provisioned for a thousand days, but Ross decided to supplement his supplies with the Fury's hoard, enough to last two years and three months. On August 15th, they passed Cape Gary, the furthest point of the coast yet discovered. They spent the rest of their journey mapping and naming the features of the seaboard, including a continuous stretch of land they named Boothia in honor of Mr. Felix Booth, who equipped the expedition. It's hard to say if it was bad luck or a lack of insight, but Ross always seemed to come up short in his search for the ultimate prize. On his previous voyage, he mistook Lancaster Sound for an inlet, which allowed Perry to claim the credit for its discovery. This time around, Ross missed out on an even greater opportunity. Just before he reached Boothia, he passed Bellot Strait, which Kennedy later found to be the direct route to the Arctic Sea, 
the northwest passage Ross sought. However, he missed his chance again. Failing to recognize it as a strait, he named it Hazard Inlet and continued on his way, completely unaware of the discovery he could have made had he examined it more closely. Soon after, the victory encountered ice, and the voyage became incredibly hazardous. The ship was in constant danger of sinking, but it survived until October 1st, when Ross found a perfect bay for winter quarters. He decided to stay, and the vessel was prepared for the longest stay an explorer had ever experienced in the Arctic until then. Nothing noteworthy happened during the first winter, but the monotony was broken up by the arrival of a friendly group of Eskimos, except for one incident where they accused half the party of killing one of their tribe members with witchcraft. The white men earned their reputation in a strange way. One of the Eskimos had lost a leg during a fight with a bear. The ship's carpenter, noting the man's severe handicap, fashioned a wooden leg for him, much to the amazement and delight of the crew. They assumed their new acquaintances possessed extraordinary powers to provide new means of locomotion for the legless man. To glean geographical information from the Eskimos, Ross often invited them to dine in his cabin, but they did not take kindly to English food. They abhorred salt meat, pudding, rice, and candy, and only consumed soup and salmon, washing it down with beakers of oil as wine did not suit their palates. The victory was freed from ice on September 17th, but their respite was brief, as they became stuck once more on September 30th, only a few miles from where they had wintered the previous year. For months, the compass and magnetic needle indicated they were near the North Magnetic Pole. Ross determined to ascertain the exact location during their enforced sojourn among the ice. In May 1831, the younger Ross and a party set out with the necessary instruments to discover the pole. They journeyed west through the Boothia wilderness, and on June 1st at 8 o'clock in the morning, they realized they had found the object of their search. There was nothing remarkable about the place, blending in with the surrounding land, save for the horizontal needles dangling delicately and completely still. The dipping needle's reading of 89 degrees 59 minutes was nearly vertical. Ross had no doubt that he was standing on the magnetic pole. He planted the British flag and claimed the territory in the name of King William IV. A cairn of stones was erected to contain a record of the discovery. After determining the latitude to be 70 degrees 5 minutes north and the longitude 96 degrees 43 west, he returned without incident. The victory was expected to sail to sea by the end of August. The bay was almost free of ice by the 27th. Adverse wind forced them into a small bay, where they became trapped in the ice. By January 1832, it was clear that the party needed to make a move if they were going to survive. Scurvy had broken out, and the crew's health was failing. Ross decided to abandon the victory and use the boats instead, but he knew from experience that the sea in that area would only be free for a short time. Sleds were prepared, and they spent the winter dragging the boats toward Fury Beach. They were weak from sickness, and the struggles of their trip were awful. But they had no other option if they wanted to live, so they kept pushing forward. They departed from the victory on May 29th, and didn't reach Fury Beach until July 2nd. The journey was over 300 miles, but they could only drag one boat at a time since they were all so weak. They had to go over the same stretch of ground two or three times. When they got to Fury Beach, they built themselves a shelter called Somerset House and stayed there waiting for the ice to melt. But once again, the gods did not treat them kindly. In August, they tried to sail to the north and the open sea, but the ice pushed them right back to shore. They tried again and again, but no luck. They had no choice but to make the best of it and go back to Somerset House for the winter. They had enough supplies from the Fury, so they weren't going to starve, but spending an Arctic winter in a barely protected cabin wasn't ideal. Their luck changed the next summer when the ice cleared from the inlet, and they were finally able to leave the place where they'd spent four brutal winters. They set sail on July 14th and were picked up on the 26th by a whaler called the Isabella of Hull, which Ross himself coincidentally captained at one point. They had a hard time convincing the boat's crew that they weren't ghosts, since everyone thought they were dead. They were taken aboard and arrived home in October. 
Ross failed in his voyage's objective, partly due to his own miscalculations, as we have already pointed out. He could have been the first to discover the Northwest Passage. Nonetheless, his expedition yielded valuable information. James Clark Ross, his nephew, located the magnetic pole and mapped out six to seven hundred miles of coastlines on either side of Boothia. He also took helpful notes on the climatic conditions of northeastern America. Ross never received full credit for his work, which was perhaps his own doing. He was an unpopular commander, and his diaries revealed a persistent pessimism that must have made him a depressing companion in the Arctic regions. Consequently, his nephew received most of the credit. He was personally responsible for discovering the magnetic pole, but he was only a member of his uncle's expedition and acted under his uncle's orders and directions. Chapter 10 The Two Journeys of Captain George Back The extended absence of Ross and his crew caused great anxiety for their loved ones at home. Many believed it was impossible for any Englishman to survive four consecutive winters in the inhospitable Arctic regions and gave up hope for their return. However, some knew of the abundance of supplies on Fury Beach and held on to the hope that they were still alive, including Mr. George Ross, a relative of the Victory's commander. Mr. Ross believed that if he could find someone to lead an expedition through northern America and then to Fury Beach, the Victory crew might be rescued, or at least some information regarding their fate could be obtained. Captain George Back, Franklin's companion on the Trent, and on two land expeditions, heard of the plan in June 1832 and offered his services, which were quickly accepted. The government took such an interest in the venture that it contributed largely to its expenses. The balance of the necessary funds were easily obtained through public and private donations. The Hudson's Bay Company also displayed its sympathy by making the way easy for the expedition and providing two boats, two canoes, and 120 bags of pemmican. Back was also authorized to collect provisions and stores at any of the company's stations. The plan of action was to spend the winter of 1833-34 to 34 at the Great Bear Lake, then attempt to navigate the great and previously unexplored river known to the Indians as the Great Fish River. It was believed to flow into either the eastern part of the Polar Sea or Prince Regent's Inlet itself. From there, it would only be 300 miles to Fury Beach, where Ross intended to call for supplies. This expedition sought to explore uncharted territory, with hopes that Back, accompanied by renowned naturalist Mr. Richard King and 18 men, would make significant scientific discoveries. They successfully reached the Great Slave Lake without incident. Despite the early season, Back led a preliminary expedition to locate the source of the Great Fish River, which had yet to be properly identified. The journey proved difficult, with numerous rivers and lakes requiring countless portages and setbacks, including the illness of an interpreter and the desertion of two Indian companions. Nonetheless, on August 31st, they reached the river and determined the boat necessary for the following year's descent. They returned to their chosen winter quarters, Fort Reliance, where construction of their dwelling was underway and a fishery had been established. However, they also found themselves with an unexpected burden, the care of sick and elderly members of nearby tribes entrusted to them by the local Indians. The fisheries' yield decreased as time passed, and food supplies dwindled. The natives blamed the explorers' misfortunes on the stone observatory they built at the fort. They couldn't understand the astronomical instruments inside, so they assumed witchcraft was at play. Two Canadian voyagers saw Back and King using the instruments and accused them of raising the devil. The party faced food shortages and extreme cold during the winter, but Akaicho, the old copper mine chief, saved them with fresh meat. Back received news of Ross and his party's safe return from the times, altering his plans. Despite this, he continued his exploration work, and with the help of skilled Bowman Sinclair and Steersman McKay, navigated the Great Fish River's rapids, falls, and rocks. Their journey was thrilling and dangerous. A story is told of Mackay, which deserves quotation. During a vital moment when the boat was being swept down one of the most dangerous rapids of the expedition, an oar broke, and the boat and its crew were on the verge of being hurled down a terrifying fall. One of the crew members began crying out for divine help, but Mackay intervened, yelling above the roar of the water, 
Is this a time for praying? Pull your starboard oar. After a treacherous voyage that covered 530 miles and navigated 83 falls, rapids, and cascades, Back and his party arrived at the mouth of the Great Fish River at the end of July. However, Back's hopes of venturing westward as far as Cape Turnagain were dashed. The shore was obstructed with ice, making navigation impossible. After waiting a few days for the sea to clear, Back decided to return home. He named the big island opposite the mouth of the river King William Land and embarked on the homeward journey on August 21st. He arrived at his destination on September 17th, and the following year he returned to England. It's worth noting that the river was renamed Back River in honor of this journey. Back was not meant to remain idle for long. In 1836, the government dispatched him to find a passage from Prince Regent's Inlet into the Polar Sea, if such a passage existed. As per his orders, he was to make his way to Wager Inlet or Repulse Bay in the Terror, which was outfitted specifically for the voyage and manned by an excellent crew, including Robert McClure, the future discoverer of the Northwest Passage, and Graham Gore, one of Franklin's companions on his last and fatal expedition. He was to spend the winter there and cross the Isthmus, joining Melville Peninsula to the mainland the following year, and continuing his journey towards Cape Turn again. Regrettably, fate did not permit him to reach his goal. The Terror was trapped in the pack before reaching Southampton Island, and the captain's attempts to release her were fruitless. Henceforth, the crew found themselves in constant jeopardy. Northerly winds drove the ice violently upon the vessel, and were it not for her exceptional strength, she would have been crushed to bits. Nonetheless, her bolts loosened, and her timbers splintered to the point where chains were necessary to hold her together beneath the keel. As winter progressed, the situation deteriorated further. The ice posed an unrelenting danger, and scurvy infected the crew, resulting in the deaths of several members. For long and tedious months they lived under the shadow of death, and only in early May, after the terror drifted to the mouth of Hudson Strait, did they dare to hope for salvation. Eventually the ice shifted away from the ship, freeing her. Nevertheless, she was so frail that she was unfit for a transatlantic voyage. Chain cables were fastened beneath her, connected to ring bolts on the quarterdeck, and with this makeshift repair, she completed the journey safely, arriving in British waters on September 3rd. Chapter 11. Peter Warren Dees and Thomas Simpson. The exploration of northern American shores was progressing rapidly. At the time of the Terror's departure for Hudson Strait, Beachy had mapped the coast from the west to Point Barrow. However, the coast between Point Barrow to Return Reef, a distance of about 150 miles, was unexamined by any white man. Franklin and Richardson's expeditions had covered the distance between Return Reef and Point Turn again. Still, the coast between that point and the mouth of the Great Fish or Back River and the shore of the Polar Sea eastward of the Great Fish River remained unexplored. The Hudson's Bay Company decided to send out an expedition in 1836 to complete the discovery and survey of the northern shores of the American continent. The command of the expedition was given to Mr. Peter Warren Dees and Mr. Thomas Simpson. Dees, who had accompanied Franklin on his 1825 to 1826 expedition, was in charge of the party due to his seniority. However, Simpson's immense enthusiasm and ability made him the actual leader, and he made the most important discoveries. The party was to consist of twelve men, in addition to the two officers, and explore the coastline between the mouth of the Mackenzie River and Point Barrow during the summer of 1837. They were to spend the winter at Great Bear Lake, and then pass down the Coppermine River in 1838 to link up Franklin's discoveries with those of Back. Dees headed for Athabasca Lake in July, and Simpson went to Red River Settlement to improve his astronomy. He knew he had to travel 1,277 miles on foot to reach Athabasca Lake in winter, but his extraordinary energy made him undeterred. Unlike his predecessors, Simpson owed much of his success to his remarkable feats and fast pace. He even marked the track through the snow single-handedly, a task usually shared among party members. During winter at Fort Chippewyan, the party built two boats, Castor and Pollux, to navigate down to the Polar Sea. They launched the boats at the end of May and began their journey on June 1st. 
they sent four men to Great Bear Lake to build quarters, establish a fishery, and prepare for their return. The party reached the shores of the Polar Sea on July 9th, and they spent the next two weeks verifying Franklin's discoveries. However, they opened up new territory after reaching Return Reef on July 23rd. The progress was slow due to fog, ice, and adverse winds, and Simpson worried they might not reach Point Barrow before winter. He decided to push forward, taking five men with him, and set off on foot to complete the rest of the journey. The weather was bitterly cold, with a biting wind blowing from the northeast and a thick fog impeding their progress. The coast was riddled with countless salt creeks that they had to wade through, making the conditions as unpleasant as they could be. On the second day of their journey, they traveled about thirty miles and stumbled upon an Eskimo encampment. Here, Simpson was able to borrow a large family canoe called an Umiak, which proved to be of great help. With its assistance, they were able to reach their destination before long. The first part of their expedition was complete, as they had surveyed the entire 150-mile coast between Return Reef and Point Barrow, thus connecting the discoveries made by Beachy and Franklin. The only thing left for them to do was to travel up the Mackenzie River to the Great Bear Lake, which they reached on September 25th. The winter passed without incident. The usual Indians came to the fort and were expected to be fed by the Englishmen. Fortunately, provisions were plentiful, and the party was never in danger of starvation, unlike some previous expeditions. The cold climate necessitated a large supply of animal food, and each man was given a daily ration of ten to twelve pounds of venison, or four to five whole fish, weighing between fifteen and twenty pounds. Some members of the party found even this to be insufficient. At the start of summer, Simpson and his crew embarked on a journey to the Coppermine River. They traveled up the Dees River and over the Dismal Lakes, facing difficulties due to the ice not yet melting. However, Simpson was resourceful and attached his boats to sturdy iron sleds, allowing them to sail with surprising speed over the lakes, astonishing the locals. Upon arriving at the copper mine, they found it swollen with melted snow and covered in loose ice. Despite the danger, the explorers refused to delay and moved quickly toward the sea. Navigating down the river was treacherous, as it flowed between massive cliffs and breakers raged below. Simpson's account of their journey through Escape Rapid, which they reached on the first day, is particularly noteworthy. He described how they had no choice but to run down the rapid with a full load of cargo. They were caught in the vortex in a moment, and his boat was drawn towards an isolated rock, nearly concealed by the surging water. They managed to run between the rock and the towering eastern cliff, with everyone holding their breath. The powerful stream from the precipice, more than one hundred feet tall, mixed with the spray from the rapid, creating a terrifying shower. The passage was around eight feet wide. A single foot's error would have meant certain destruction. Sinclair's expert guidance ensured the boat made it safely through the deadly passage, and an involuntary cheer erupted. Their next instinct was to turn and witness their comrades' fate behind us. They had avoided the treacherous rock in time, but the waves were still high, pushing them out of sight of them for a while. When they re-emerged, the first thing visible was the bowman spitting out a portion of the intrusive wave he swallowed and looking half-drowned. Later, Mr. Dees said that the spray, completely enveloping them, formed a beautiful rainbow around the boat. They arrived at the shores of the Polar Sea on July 1st, but disappointment awaited them. The winter had been severe and long, causing the sea's shores to be covered with ice, making navigation almost impossible. They slowly pushed forward, but both Coronation Gulf and Melville Sound were completely covered in solid ice. By August 19th, when it was nearly time to return, they were still three miles behind Franklin's furthest point. Their boats could not go any further, but Simpson was determined to set foot on land never trodden by Europeans. With a team of seven men, he began a ten-day journey eastward. The path was painful, filled with loose stones and numerous brooks and streams. However, their efforts paid off. Simpson had feared the coastline of the Polar Sea was not continuous due to the land's formation. On August 23rd, he reached a tall cape, and upon climbing it, he discovered that he had only been traveling along the southern shore of a strait. 
Below him lay an immense sea stretching as far as the eye could see, while to the north he saw an extensive land he named Queen Victoria Land. After a few miles south-southeast, the expedition had to turn back. The five days for the outgoing journey had expired. On the 29th, they rejoined the rest of the party at Boathaven, and on September 4th, they began their journey up the copper mine. Until now, it had been considered impossible to ascend the copper mine by boat. Simpson, however, was determined to prove the reverse. With infinite labor, he towed the boat safely up all the rapids. On September 5th, they reached a spot about four miles below the junction of Kendall River, which they considered the nearest point to Fort Confidence. They dragged the boats out of the water, left them high and dry in a wood, and returned to their winter quarters on foot. They reached their journey's end on September 14th. Everything was ready for the long winter. The buildings were in order, a quantity of dried venison had been purchased from the Indians, and several thousand fish had been caught and cured. They were in no danger of want, and spent their time in comparative comfort until June brought a release from the frost. As soon as it was possible, they set off for the point on the copper mine at which they had left the castor and pollux, and in due time they reached the polar sea. In the first week or so, their progress was slow. However, the season was far more open than the previous year. On reaching Coronation Gulf, they found it navigable. From that point, they pushed on apace. On the night of the 20th, they stopped at Boathaven, and helped by a favoring wind, they ran rapidly along the west coast of Kent Peninsula to Cape Franklin. Here, they were favored by fortune, for they found an open passage of water, two miles wide, along which the boat sailed merrily. They reached Cape Alexander on the 26th, and then rounding the eastern extremity of Kent Peninsula, they ran along the shore which they had been previously obliged to traverse on foot, discovering and naming Melbourne Island and Roxborough Cape as they went. On the 10th, they sailed into the strait that goes by Simpson's name. It dawned on them that they were on the brink of joining Franklin's discoveries with those of Back. The swift flow of the tide from the east indicated they were about to enter the open sea where the great fish river flowed. On the 13th, they rounded a sharp cape and saw a sandy desert, which they recognized as Back's Ogle Point. Having reached the Great Fish River estuary, they had achieved their expedition's objectives. However, Simpson was not content to rest on his laurels. He resolved to discover if the North American continent was connected to Boothia Felix, or if a strait linked the Boothia Gulf with the Arctic Sea. With his customary vigor, he chose three volunteers and embarked on a short exploration voyage in one of the boats. Unfortunately, adverse winds forced them to seek refuge in a small river he named after Castor and Pollux on the 20th. Continuing would have been reckless and jeopardized the entire party. Thus, having confirmed his position as latitude 68 degrees 28 north and longitude 94 degrees 14 west, he returned, reaching Cape Britannia on August 20th, where Dees had stayed. They decided to spice up their return journey by sailing along the coast of Victoria Land, which had never been explored. They reached its nearest point, which they called Cape Colborne, on September 6th. They spent the 7th and 8th crossing two vast bays, which they named Cambridge and Wellington Bays. On the 9th, they were nearly opposite Cape Franklin, and the American continent's shore was about 20 miles away. They sailed to Cape Barrow the following day, having explored approximately 156 miles of the new country. The copper mine climb was tough. Winter had arrived, making the rocky ice treacherous for the boat-towing men. Nevertheless, they made it safely to Fort Confidence on September 25th. From there, they went to Fort Simpson, where the leader planned to write about their journey and discoveries. By December 2nd, he finished and departed for Red River Settlement, arriving on February 2nd. He had traveled 1,900 miles on foot in 61 days. Sadly, this was his last adventure. He died a few months later, and it remains unclear whether he was murdered or committed suicide. The story goes like this. The governor of the Hudson's Bay Company was a relative of the explorer, but didn't like him much. Even though the expedition accomplished great things, the governor felt they could have done more. In a letter, he expressed disappointment that they weren't prepared to spend another year in the Arctic to explore fury.
and Hecla Strait. However, the explorer had already told him that his men were exhausted and food was scarce. The governor's attitude was unreasonable. The explorer offered to lead another expedition north the following year to survey Boothia Felix and attempt to pass through Fury and Hecla Strait to reach Hudson's Bay. The governor ignored the offer and hinted that someone else might lead the next expedition. Simpson was deeply wounded by the governor's attitude and sent him a strongly worded letter on the subject. Consequently, he was directed to return to England immediately. The controversy appears to have gravely impacted the explorer's well-being, as evidenced from some of the letters he wrote to the governor, indicating he was experiencing considerable mental agitation. If only he had known, there was a high possibility of him continuing his impressive work as an explorer. In fact, a letter he had written to the directors of the Hudson's Bay Company, proposing a new voyage of exploration through the Gulf of Boothia, had been received with great positivity by them. They even sent him a formal response appointing him to lead a new expedition a few days after he began his journey home from the Red River settlement. On June 6, 1840, he bade farewell to his friends and embarked toward St. Peter's with a group consisting of James Bruce from the Red River settlement, a father and son named Legrosse, and John Byrd. The sworn testimony of Bruce regarding the events that occurred during the journey is as follows. On June 14th, Simpson appeared restless and unwell. He frequently expressed his desire to return to the Red River settlement and urged the others to accompany him. He did not seem to be suffering from any particular ailment, but he still wanted to consult a doctor and told his companions that he feared he could not live much longer. Later that evening, Bruce, Bird, and the elder Legros were setting up the tent, their backs turned towards their leader. Suddenly, Bruce heard a gunshot and turned around to see that Simpson had shot Bird, who fell dead instantly. Simpson then aimed his gun at the elder Legros, wounding him fatally, although he didn't die immediately. Once they had recovered from their horror and astonishment, Bruce and the younger Legros approached Simpson, who informed them that he had learned of a plot by Bird and Legros to kill him during the night for his papers, and that he had only acted in self-defense. Before he passed away, Legros denied any such conspiracy, and even today it remains unclear whether or not Simpson had any basis for his suspicions. The young adventurer stood with his firearm, while Bruce and the younger Legros fled to locate a larger group of travelers they had left behind the previous day. After sounding the alarm, they gathered five men and returned to the site of the murders. They called out to him upon approaching the cart where Simpson had been stationed. The only answer was the sound of a gunshot and a bullet whistling through the air. It was unclear that Simpson had taken his own life, prompting the group to fire their weapons as intimidation. But it proved unnecessary. Simpson's body lay lifeless, and the bodies of Legros and Bird were also found nearby. The three were buried together on the spot. Bruce shared this account, but there was no evidence to corroborate it, and the younger Legros was not questioned. Given Simpson's health at the time, it's possible that he believed he was acting in self-defense when he shot Legros and Bird. We may never know whether Simpson ended his own life or was shot by Bruce or someone else in the group. Chapter 12 The Final Voyage of Sir John Franklin Back's expedition on the Terror didn't achieve much causing the government to pause Arctic exploration and shift focus to the Antarctic. However, Dees and Simpson's successful journey reignited public interest in Arctic exploration. When the Erebus and Terror returned from the Antarctic, the Royal Geographical Society and scientists urged the authorities to send them on another expedition. Franklin, the senior Arctic explorer, was appointed as commander. Despite concerns about his age, Franklin was determined to go. The Erebus and Terror were equipped with modern technology, including engines and extra screws. The Navy carefully selected experienced officers, including Fitzjames, Crozier, and Gore. Franklin's official orders were to swiftly pass through Lancaster Sound, without wasting time exploring northward openings. After reaching Cape Walker, he was to turn south and east in search of a path to the Bering Strait. If unsuccessful, he would head north up Wellington Channel in the second summer. The two ships departed from the Thames on May 19, 1845, and made good progress up Baffin Bay, 
We learn of the early part of the journey through the letters of Commander Fitzjames, who wrote to Mrs. Coningham. His descriptions of his companions are charming and worth preserving. In one passage he speaks of Franklin, I like a man who is in earnest. Sir John Franklin read the church service today in a sermon so very beautifully that I defy any man not to feel the force of what he would convey. Fitzjames also comments on the purser Osmer. I have just had a game of chess with the purser, Osmer, who is delightful. I was at first inclined to think that he was a stupid old man because he had a chin and took snuff. But he is as merry-hearted as any young man, full of quaint, dry sayings, always good-humored, always laughing, never a bore, takes his pinch after dinner, and beats me at chess. And he is a gentleman. The next sketch concerns Harry Goodsir, assistant surgeon of the Erebus, renowned for his skill as a naturalist. Before joining the expedition, he served as curator of the Edinburgh Museum. Fitzjames wonders why Scottish men always speak in a low, hesitant tone, which he calls canniness. Good sir is canny, standing tall and walking on his toes with his hands in his pockets. He's good-natured, knowledgeable, a natural history expert, and only about twenty-eight years old. He loves all ologies, draws microscopic animals, and catches phenomena in a bucket. He's a delightful companion and a valuable addition to the mess. Crouch, the mate, is a quiet fellow who reads, writes, and draws. He's always available but obstinate. Stanley, the surgeon, is chubby and good-looking, with jet-black hair and always clean hands. He's the type who would eagerly amputate a leg if asked. Graham Gore, the first lieutenant, is a stable and excellent officer with a sweet disposition. He's also a talented flutist, but his drawing skills are hit or miss. Overall, a great guy.